I'm Katie, and I work at Lightdash, which is an open source BI tool. And today I'm going to be talking a bit about why I think data products are not just for data teams. So in 2022, Tableau commissioned Forrester Consulting and run this big survey across, I think, 2,000 organizations where they asked these organizations about data literacy at their companies. And they found that organizations that actually um, invested in data literacy and education found increases in productivity and in innovation and in customer and employee experiences. Uh, and they found that 82% of the leaders expected all employees to have basic data, data literacy and 70% of employees were expected to heavily use data by 2025, which was up by 40% in 2018. And all of this is kind of just reinforcing the fact that data isn't just for data teams anymore. So we have this huge growing population of data literate people, and they're going to want their answers to be based off of data. So when it comes to talking about people in a company that are actually using data, we now have these two personas, the data team, which we've always had, but then there's the rest of the company or business users or data consumers, as I like to call them. And so as the people building the products for these data tools, uh, we have to be asking ourselves, how are we actually building products that serve both of these users, not just data teams anymore, but also these people that are really data literate and wanting to build data tools as well or use data tools as well. Um, so I think that data products are not just for data teams anymore. And I think that we need to be building products that can be used by data teams, but also by the rest of the company. And for the rest of my time here, I'm going to be talking about how we can actually use design principles to help us with building products for multiple personas. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard of design principles before or aren't that familiar with them, they're basically values that kind of act as like a compass when you're building your product. So they can be really helpful in simplifying really complex business decisions or product decisions. They can guide you to asking the right questions when you're building products. And for multiple personas here, it becomes a bit more complicated. Um, and so the three design principles that I'm going to talk about are flexibility and usability, forgiveness, and familiarity. And I'm going to talk about all of these through the lens of building a BI tool because conveniently I'm building a BI tool, so I know a bit about it. But also, when we think about kind of tools that, oh, uh, when we think about tools that interface uh, the data team and the rest of the business, a BI tool is a really obvious one, right? It's where the data team shares a lot of their insights and it's where the data consumers consume most, if not all, of their data insights. So if we build an amazing BI tool for the data team that everyone else hates, then we've built a terrible BI tool. So we really need to make sure that we're building for these multiple personas. Um, yeah, so the first design principle I want to talk about is flexibility versus usability. And a real life example of this is installing software on your machine. So if you have a Linux computer, you'll be familiar with something in the top left and a Mac with something in the bottom right. Now, my brother is a software engineer. He's like someone who's like a purist and codes in Vim and like loves configurability. So Linux is an amazing way of like the, the experience of installing software on a Linux machine is great. It's super flexible. It's really configurable. It kind of lets him do exactly what he wants. Um, my flatmate is a skiing instructor. So he doesn't know what the terminal is and he just wants to like get things on his computer, like viruses and all, like he's just like, get it in there. I don't want to do anything else. Uh, so something like the Mac, uh, the Mac's approach to installing software is definitely built more for him. It's like very usable, few steps to get to your uh, end goal. And so this is a great example of flexibility and usability. Now, the thing about flexibility and usability is it's a trade-off, right? So if you increase flexibility, then you decrease usability. And we want to be really considerate of this when we're building products for multiple personas so that we're really conscious of what the goal is or the task that we're trying to accomplish when we're building the product. Are we focusing on flexibility or usability? And how can we do that? So the UX tactic that we can use here is we can ask the question, what are our users' goals for this product or this task? And if you have users that want customization and control, then they want flexibility, right? If you want to make the least amount of decisions to accomplish the goal, they want a really usable product. And you can have a heavy mix of both of these. And a great way of handling that is by actually creating a visual difference so that users can see the two experiences and pick the one that they want. Um, 
Now in BI, we interact with charts in BI a lot. And so we went and we made sure that we asked our users, what is your goal when you open a chart? to both business users and kind of the data team. And when you ask business users, normally their goal is, I really want to just get in and out, right? Like I want to see the chart, I want to see the data, understand what's going on, and then like out of there into Excel as fast as possible. Um, but when you talk to the data team, they tend to say, I'm using a chart to build another chart. It's like the chart is a building block to really the next chart, which is where they'll customize it or kind of dig deeper into something. So here we had a mix of two user goals. One was very much usability, which is uh, the business user's focus. They want to get in and out fewest steps possible to get to their task completion. Whereas the data team was much more focused on flexibility and customization. And so the way that we dealt with this was kind of going back to the last slide, where we give a visual uh, option where people can pick the different paths that they want to go down for a flexible versus usable experience. So when you open a chart, you open it in this view mode here, which is really minimal, really usable, kind of very not distracting. But then if you click explore from here or you click edit, then you open a chart in edit mode, which is much more customizable and kind of fit for the data team's goals when interacting with charts. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a great example or a classic example of building a flexible versus usable product and making sure you're identifying your user's goals and building for them. And so the next design principle is forgiveness. Uh, this is a really good example of this is turning off your phone, right? Uh, normally turning off your phone is a two-step operation. You have to push a button and then swipe something. Uh, and this is because turning off your phone is like a critical error, right? If you turn off your phone, it doesn't phone anymore. So uh, you don't really want to be like doing it by accident. Um, so the way that they've built in forgiveness into the product is you don't do it by accident. Like you have to really be like, I don't know, moving your butt in a funny way to like accidentally turn off your phone. Um, and so... Forgiveness is really important when we're thinking about building great data products. And the way that we can do this is we can ask our users, what is the worst thing that you think can happen here? And we need to make sure that we're talking to both sets of users, right, about their scariest consequences, because they can be different. And then once we find out those consequences, we want to make sure it's really unlikely to happen. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can use established uh, usability patterns like red buttons are bad, or you can add previews of changes, or you can also add confirmations and warnings when they're doing kind of a critical task. And when you're onboarding users into a BI tool, the most common uh, scary thing for business users is, oh my God, I don't want to break something. And then for data team, it's like, oh my God, I don't want people to break my stuff. Um, so you have like really two clear consequences. And we wanted to make sure that when it came to like exploring save chart that we were uh, kind of avoiding these consequences for both users. So this is what you see when you open a chart and what button are you probably going to press? Well, the giant blue one, right? Um, so we used established uh, usability palette patterns here to make sure that we were minimizing the consequence for users and the big blue button leads you to a really safe place where you're not actually editing a save chart and you're making sure that delete and edit are hidden behind that gray button. So you have to like really explicitly wanting to be do those actions, wanting to be doing those actions. Uh, um, yeah, so this is an example of building forgiveness into your product and minimizing kind of the worst consequences for your users. And the last design principle we have is familiarity. And this one, I kind of love this one. I find this one's the most interesting. Um, there are design patterns that have been established in almost every product we use. And it's kind of cool when you think about them. So here, if I show you a bunch of web app and mobile um, headers, banners, and I ask you, where is the menu? You'll be like, oh, that three line thing. Uh, we didn't get taught that in like school. I don't know about you, I didn't get like hamburger icon lessons, but we just like know that that's where the menu icon is. And that's because it's a really familiar design pattern. And the amazing thing about familiar design patterns is that they really reduce uh, the learning curve for a product. So they increase also the speed at which a task is completed. And that means you're ultimately like increasing user retention and who doesn't want that? So building familiarity into your product can be really helpful, especially when you're building for multiple personas. And the UX tactic here is to ask the question, is there a familiar experience for both of our personas that we can use here? So it's really important to do competitor research to, for both of your user personas to understand if there are any products 
um, that they're both using that you can build familiar experiences into. You can use basic established usability patterns like we've already talked about, and you can also kind of get an actual prototype and get people to use it. Like, can they guess what it does? Uh, when you ask them to do the task, can they complete it successfully? And is it a familiar experience to them? Now, when it comes to uh, data and building a BI tool, one of the most important tasks is being able to dig into the data further, right? Like from day zero, we want people to be able to do this with little to no effort. So we made sure that we um, did kind of, we wanted to build a familiar process for both the data teams and the business users here. So we did some user research, we did some competitor research, and what we found is that the most intuitive and kind of familiar and frequent way of interacting with data was clicking on it. Um, and so once we knew that, we were like, okay, well, we want to build it so that people can click on stuff to interact with it. And we wanted to make sure that clicking was really intuitive. So things that are clickable look clickable. They either change color or the pointer changes or, you know, it gets grayed out or something. And what this meant was that a really important task in our BI tool, which was interacting with data, was super familiar and easy to kind of get on board with from day zero. And yeah, those are three design principles of uh, flexibility and usability, forgiveness and familiarity that can help us with building for multiple personas. But why should we care? Like why, sure there's like this data literate population, but like why do we actually care about building for them? And I think that the increase in data literacy is gonna be limited by data tools unless we start actually changing how we build them. And what I mean by that is unless we start building tools for this data literate population that isn't the data team, uh, we're gonna be the reason why there's not an increase in data literacy. Um, so that means like thinking about those business users preferred UX. Do, th do they actually wanna be in BI tools? Should we actually just like have native integrations in their favorite things like Slack and Notion? Um, or do they wanna like use natural querying language for data? Do they just don't kind of care about SQL and we need to make it more approachable for them? And I think once they actually get into those tools and get access to that data, we need to help them in making, um, using data to make decisions, right? So we need to increase uh, and standardize the context and data tools. We need to improve like the metadata for them um, so that they're more confident in self-service when it comes to data decisions. And otherwise, like I said, I think that as the people building these data tools, ultimately we're gonna become the limiting factor in how much we can actually increase data literacy. Um, and the way that we can avoid this is by building data tools with both of these personas in mind. So we can use design principles to help us with um, making these decisions, and there's a lot more design principles out there, but really the idea is to consider these people when we're building design tools. Uh, and that's everything. Thanks so much for listening.